head teacher and a teacher discussing a school camping trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Mr Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie, what's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year 10. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the 23rd to the 26th, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, uh, actually, I think it's the 24th to the 27th. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So... Well... I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but... Suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So, what have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching and I think I've found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and... Is that the campsite in the Lake District? No. Actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid £5 a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid £10 for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only £4 per night. And they told me that if we had over 50 children, which we do, they could give us a further 10% off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. OK, so, now, these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes, go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around 7 on Friday evening. It'll still be light then and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At 8 we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare. And that children love. Yes. Then lights out would be at 9.30 so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at 7 on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at 7.30, an hour's hiking from 8 till 9, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to 11. 
I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know? Yes, great idea. And then? Let's see, a picnic lunch at 12, and then sports in the afternoon till 4. Another swim until 5, and then supper. After clean-up, around 6.30, we could have a talk-back session, where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at 8, back to the tents at 9.30, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organized games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about employment interviews. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the Local Workforce Center, and she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment, the interview. Sandy, what is an interview for, and what's the best way to approach it? A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search, and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance, and make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post. The more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. 
You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. Most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions, but don't dwell too long on non-job related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So, if the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that, again, show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. The more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become you'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three.
Part three. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, Jake and Amanda, how did the project go? Very well, I think, Doctor Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically, what makes successful people? Let's call them. Top achievers, successful. Yes. How are they different from us? What do they do that other less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it, but it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself, with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax, could leave their work at the office, prize close friends and family life, and spent a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway. Go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important, though, Amanda. Yes, I agree. But being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer. And only one third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Actually, in the end, they often have both, because they enjoy what they are doing, so their work is better and their rewards higher. Yes, Jake, that certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive, who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hardworking people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright. She is so worried that she has missed something; she still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well, 
top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. They don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them, so they can do better next time. Hmm. Well, would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I, or we, came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes, and we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognise that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals, and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes, loners who are often over concerned about rivals can't delegate important work or decision making. Their performance is limited because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job. And learn something into the bargain too. Now there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Many typically American characteristics: individualism, self-reliance, informality, punctuality, and directness are a result of those values mentioned earlier. Other national traits could also be identified, however. One, Americans cooperate. Although often competitive, Americans also have a good sense of teamwork and cooperate with others to achieve a goal. Two. Americans are friendly, but in their own way. In general, friendships among Americans tend to be shorter and more casual than friendships among people from other cultures. This has something to do with American mobility. And the fact that Americans do not like to be dependent on other people, Americans also tend to compartmentalize friendships, having friends at work, family friends, friends on the softball team, etc. Three, Americans ask a lot of questions, some of which may to you seem pointless, uninformed, or elementary. Someone you have just met may ask you very personal questions. No impertinence is intended. The questions usually grow out of a genuine interest. Four, Americans tend to be internationally naive. Many Americans are not very knowledgeable about international geography or world affairs. They may ask uninformed questions about current events and may display ignorance of world geography. Because the U.S. is not surrounded by many other nations. Some Americans tend to ignore the world. Five. Silence makes Americans nervous. Americans are not comfortable with silence. They would rather talk about the weather than deal with silence in a conversation.
Six, Americans are open and usually eager to explain. If you do not understand certain behavior or want to know what makes Americans tick, do not hesitate to ask questions. Just as values and traits differ somewhat from one culture to another, so do the personal habits associated with good manners and courtesy. While very often there does not seem to be any particular reason why a particular way of doing something is considered good manners, observing these cultural rules will make Americans more comfortable with you, and therefore you with them. It is, of course, impossible to cover all the possibilities here. If you are unsure in a situation, just ask. Americans like to be helpful. One, queuing up or lining up is essential. Courtesy requires that you do not push from behind, stand next to the person being helped, or cut into a line. If you should accidentally bump someone, you should say, "Excuse me." Two, Americans blow their noses into a tissue. Spitting, clearing phlegm, or sniffing as from a cold are considered rude. Three, it is considered poor manners to slurp, chew noisily, or open your mouth while chewing. Four, questions are seen as a good way of getting acquainted, but questions about a person's age, financial affairs, cost of clothing or personal belongings, religious affiliations, and sex life. Are considered too personal for questioning, except between very close friends. Five, men generally do not hold hands or link arms in public with other men. This is somewhat more acceptable between women and quite common between men and women. Now, a few words about personal safety. Unfortunately, in the U.S., one must be aware of crimes. It is wise to be especially careful until you are familiar with the community in which you live. Remember that good judgment and common sense can significantly reduce chances of having an unpleasant and perhaps harmful experience. Basic safety rules include the following: one, do not walk alone at night; two, when you leave your room, apartment, or automobile, make sure that all doors are locked. And all windows are secured. Three, do not carry too much cash or wear jewelry of great value. Four, never accept a ride from a stranger. Do not hitchhike and do not pick up hitchhikers. Five, be careful of purses and wallets, especially in crowded metropolitan areas, where there may be purse snatchers and pickpockets. Six. If a robber threatens you at home or on the street, try not to resist unless you feel that your life is in danger and you must fight or run away. Give up your valuables as calmly as you can, and observe as much as possible about the robber to tell the police when you report the crime. A final note: keep an open mind. Don't judge what you see as right or wrong. But make it a challenge to try to understand the variety of American behaviors which you may observe. You certainly do not have to participate in something you disagree with, but you can try to understand it. This will help you build an attitude of intelligent and liberated respect for cultures, both your own and others. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Welcome to our channel. Today in this video, I'll discuss with you writing task two. And the question for today is: Some people think that the most important function of music is to help people relax. To what extent do you agree or disagree with this given notion? 
so the question is all about that most important aspect of music is to help people relax so let's start with the introduction the music industry is proliferating means it is increasing these days many people believe that the most important aspect of music is its ability to relax them music however relaxes the mind but i do not completely agree with this notion because different people have diverse perspective means different people have different opinions on it depending on their preferences and circumstances so as perception varies from person to person for different people its functionality could be different so that's why i am not completely disagreeing with this notion so i am not completely agreeing with this notion and i do not even completely disagree so i going for 30 70 like it helps to relax people but it has other important function for different people starting with the body paragraph 1 there is no ounce of doubt listening to music make people feel more uplifted elevated soothed and relaxed no doubt music help people to make feel elevated soothed and relaxed many people like to listen to music depending on their situation to be more specific some individual prefer music to pass the time so some people listen to music just to pass the time while other prefer to relish every lyric and still others prefer it to make their special day even more memorable so some people prefer it to just to pass their time okay while other prefer it to relish every lyric so other people prefer listening to music because they just want to relish they enjoy they want to enjoy or they just want to feel every lyric every word of the song and still other prefer it to make their special day even more memorable such as for dancing at parties furthermore music can change a person's emotions and feelings in a matter of seconds people may become enthralled and while listening to music to a party music and depressed when listening to a sorrowful lyrical song so it can also you know change the emotions and feeling of a person in just in matter of a second okay and because if someone is listening a parting song that the person must be enthralled and if someone is listening a song which has sorrowful lyrics then the person may feel depressed nonetheless music has also been proved to be proved to improve athletic performance music might motivate people to get up and move more making exercise more pleasurable so that could also be some a function for some people okay they prefer listening to music while doing exercise music integrated physical activity program participation increase their performance even more many people though use music to help them concentrate on their tasks so some people may think that the most important aspect of music is to help them to concentrate in their tasks for example according to a poll or according to a study 60% of students prefer to listen to music while studying since it helps them to concentrate on their studies as a result various people have diverse perspective or you can say opinion or view points on music functionality so for different people the functionality of music could be different lastly the conclusion to summarize music has numerous facets means numerous aspects but the significance of each one is determined by the circumstances and the situation because individual's perception or we can say opinion may differ because many people have various opinions on music's noteworthiness means its functions people have different views So this was for today if you like the video do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel I'll meet in the next video till then bye bye and take care